You have to go yeah. out and come around the back to get up. Thank you very much. I'm also the pastor of Church of the Messiah, which actually pays my salary for all me to be able to do all that other stuff. So I should mention that, since that's pretty important. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, this organization, Dig and Delve, we uh, teamed up with the main atheist organization in Ottawa, main atheist and skeptic organization in Ottawa, to have an evening of conversation around the meaning of life. And uh, they got to pick their speaker, and we got to pick our speaker, and conversation is a far more gentle way of discussing like a debate, uh, where they could just uh, share their views and have good conversation uh, on the topic of the meaning of life. And I think that particular evening, the speaker that represented the Christian uh, point of view, Os Guinness, I think he did a far, far better job and would have convinced far more people. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Christian and I think that Christians always do better in things. That would be a stupid thing to say. Christians aren't always good in conversations. We uh, often flub them uh, spectacularly to our depression. But part of the reason I think that he did a better job is that it was partly my role. I was one of the people who had to, to lock everything up. And so uh, when most of the people had gone and there was a book table for the, uh, the atheist uh, organization, the skeptics organization, I, I got to hear them talk. I was just off in the corner and I got to hear them talk. And I must have heard them say at least 10 times, it doesn't matter how our speaker did this evening because evolution proves that atheism is true. I, I heard that probably 10 times. It doesn't matter how our speaker did tonight um, because evolution proves uh, that atheism is true. And uh, just, to just to be clear, I agree with them. In fact, just to be clear, I think Jesus would agree with them that if evolutionary theory is true, that uh, atheism is probably true. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment, about why it is that I think Jesus would say the exact same thing. I'm just going to mention right now that when I say evolution, uh, it's just simpler to say that than neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. I'm constrained in time, and to say that every time would probably take me an extra minute of my 20 minutes, so I'll just say evolution. And that is the scientific theory. Uh, it is the scientific uh, theory that explains how all life, the world of life we see around us, came about as a result of purely natural processes that at no time were directed by God or planned. So no God is needed to account for life, and it is widely believed that this is settled and proven by science. Uh, we all know this. This is what is taught at school, uh, elementary school, high school, university. It's what the media says. And in fact, I think it's so settled in Canada that anyone who claims to be educated and reasonable, uh, and at all concerned with the truth, will just accept that the evolution is a settled, proven theory. And to deny this is like saying that you believe the Earth is flat. Uh, and people will just go like this, like, come on, really? Uh, this was perfectly illustrated a couple of years ago. Uh, I used to say that I run along the canal, now I sort of go at a very fast shuffle uh, as I get older. But a couple of years ago, on a beautiful sunny day, a spring day, I was off for a run along the canal and there was a CTV reporter just up ahead of me with a cameraman and they waved me down and asked if they could ask me a couple of questions and the cameraman got his camera and zoomed in on me. And uh, they were obviously looking for men of a certain age and I fit that category and he, they said, uh, are you aware of whatever it is, New England Journal of Medicine has just reported some type of study how uh, long time, long distance running, you know, whatever it is, I can't remember it is, it prevents Parkinson's or cancer or heart, like whatever it is, some new study. Do you, are you aware of that and what do you think about it? Now, I, obviously, I did not go out on my run thinking I was going to be interviewed by CTV along the canal. Um, but I said, uh, I said, well, uh, that makes sense. Uh, running is natural and it's good for you. And so it makes sense that when God created all things, that things that fit with his creation would be good for you. That makes complete sense. I really wish there had been somebody behind me filming <laughs> me saying that to the CTV reporter. He literally did this with this look of shock on his face that I actually said it was a result of creation. So he went, ah, ba da ba da ba da ba da uh, I guess that makes sense, the way we evolved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, he was giving me a chance to put myself 
out of the camp of knuckle draggers on the ground and into the camp of reasonable people because I wasn't drooling and I looked reasonable. And so he tried to reframe it and I said, no, 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 no. I, if God, I believe God created all things and so it makes sense that if we do something natural, given that God has created all things, that that would have good consequences for it. At that point in time, he sputtered a couple of things and he could see that he was looking for a better person to interview. And I, uh, I, I always meant, I, I never watched the CTV, actually I don't watch any news, that's a whole other topic. Uh, so I don't know if I made it on, but I doubt it. Now I've just outed myself, by the way. Uh, but just after having outed myself, I want to make it very, very clear about a couple of important things. Uh, I hope that we all agree that the truth matters. And I hope that we all agree that we should believe the truth and, and, and the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We should seek the truth. And as, a, and as a part of that, that reason matters, that the scientific method matters, that evidence matters, that science matters. And we all should be pursuing those things. We should believe the truth and want to know the truth. I hope we all believe as well that no one should believe something on blind faith in the face of evidence to the contrary. Like, that's, that's what I believe, and I hope we all believe. In fact, probably part of the reason you're here tonight is because you have that same commitment as me. Whether you believe in evolution or, like myself, believe that God created all things out of nothing. Uh, we all hopefully share that same belief that evidence, truth, reason, good questions matter. And in fact, these sessions are all designed around you asking questions. I, I encourage you to send in the hardest good question uh, you can think of because questions and truth and reason matters. And uh, so I hope you ask them. But here's the thing. If we are concerned with truth and evidence and questions, then we need to say this. Evolution, the truth of evolution cannot be contained. The truth of evolution cannot be contained. What do I mean by this? I mean, that's just the way reason works in general as well. Once you understand something to be really true, it has other types of consequences and a whole range of thought. And something as big as evolution will have wide-ranging uh, implications in, in, just about for everything, almost. The truth of evolution, if it's true, cannot be contained. What I mean by that is that, first of all, it means that the truth of evolution is not just a challenge to Christianity. I actually will say that, in fact, the only religion or system of thought or spirituality that has attempted to grapple with it is Christianity. I think that would in fact just be historically true. But in fact, if evolution is true, it's not just a challenge to Christianity. It's a challenge that has to be dealt with by every religion, every spirituality, and every system of thought has to deal with it. Hinduism has to deal with it. Islam has to deal with it. Native spirituality you believe in native spirituality? How can you believe in native spirituality if evolution is true? And if you haven't attempted to actually deal with evolution, why should I listen to you about native spirituality? The average Canadian at a funeral. Now I think that my Uncle Bob is up there in heaven looking down at you. No. <laughs> that when you die, you go to a better place. Really? How can that possibly be true if evolution is true? If everything that exists, all life that exists, is a result of purely natural processes with no God, how on earth could it possibly be that when you, go to, when you die, you go to a better place? That all has to be ruled out of hand. But there's more. If evolution is true, it means that death is final. And not only that death is final, but the death of all life is final. The second law of thermodynamics wins and eventually there will be no life anywhere, and that all that we've accomplished comes to an end with death. It's a problem for morality, if we believe that evolution is true. It's a problem not only for morality, but for the worth of, an, uh, the worth of human beings. Because you see, if evolution is true, why is it that we think that we matter more or are of more value than a rock? Both the rock and you are a result of pure, natural processes with no end in mind. There is no difference between you and a rock, other than the fact that you think there's a difference about you. But you're mistaken if evolution is true. 
So how can there be human dignity and value if that is true? And it goes the same with morality. You see, this is the, this is the huge problem with evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory says that, not, not, it's not the problem with evolutionary theory, it's the problem with the fact that most Canadians have never thought about the issue. They live um, a type of schizoid life. That's how we live. We believe in all these things, and we believe in evolution. We believe that evolution proves that Christianity is true, but we've never actually tried to put our own beliefs together with evolution. You see, this is, the, this is what evolution teaches. The strong survive and the weak die. Usually the strong survive and the weak die because the strong get to eat the weak. So how does it work? How does it work to say the strong eat the weak and survive, therefore love one another? What? The strong eat the weak and survive, therefore love one another. I'd leave that to you to try to figure out how those things could ever possibly make any type of sense. But the fact of the matter is we have a deep sense that humans matter, that death is not final, that some things are in fact right. Uh, we have a very deep sense, unless we're caught in depression, that these types of things are very, very true but we have to stick with science and truth. But here's another aspect about how the truth of evolution cannot be contained. You cannot hold that God designed the inorganic universe and that the evolution just, call, uh, just explains how life began. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. But then evolution has a problem. Evolution must claim that matter, energy, pure chance, and cause and effect accounts for life and the intricate, fine-tuned universe. That's what evolution has to prove and believe, because the truth of evolution cannot be contained if we are committed to questions and reason and science and evidence. Matter and energy, pure chance and cause and effect accounts for life and the intricate, fine-tuned universe. But what if, as science develops, it becomes more and more clear that there is, in fact, that the way the universe looks is as if it was designed? Not just believed upon as a matter of religious dogma, but the actual process of science as it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into subatomic particles and, 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 and farther and farther and farther until the entire shape of the universe it, what if, as it studies the inorganic and the organic level, it becomes more and more, conscience, uh, more and more conscious that the fact that something like design has to be true and that natural processes in and of themselves cannot account for the intricacy and the fine-tuning of things. Imagine if you went to Mars, we finally get to go to Mars and human beings start to walk on it, and if on Mars they find a ruined spaceship, now, it will be front page news. Sorry, that's old fashioned newspapers. It will be on the head of your stream on your phone. For those dinosaurs amongst us who still read on paper, it would be front page news. But for the rest, it would be everywhere. It would be everywhere if they found a ruined spaceship. But no one would say, oh, isn't that funny? There's a, that's just happened. I guess there was a series of sandstorms or whatever, and as a result of that, this thing that looks like a ruined spaceship on Mars just happened. Nobody would believe that. In fact, if somebody said that as a, as a tweet, they would, well, all the Twitter trolls would haunt them for a long, long time, and they'd want to cancel their Twitter account and Instagram and Facebook and everything, because we would not believe that it just happened. It's so obviously designed. But what if as we study DNA and the structure of the cell, what if we study the process of genetic uh, processes? What if we look at the speed of the Earth's rotation and the distance from the sun and the very nature of light and gravity itself? And the more that we look at that and the more that we understand that and the more that science develops, the clearer that it becomes and the clearer it looks that there has to be design that pure chance cannot account for the intricate, fine-tuned universe. And the more that science develops, it is intricate and fine-tuned. 
And that, by the way, is why we have a physicist and a biologist who will be speaking tonight and tomorrow. But some of you might say, George, if you accept design, you're going to kill science. You will kill science if you accept design and a designer. And you're going to force us to believe in a young earth. I think our Jewish Orthodox friends, I think we're just started year 5,778. I think that's for our Jewish friends, that's, that's the beginning of the year, just started. And so many will say, George, if you accept the idea of design and a designer, you kill science and force us to believe in the young earth. Well, that's the reason we have John Patrick and Bob Larmer here, to show how, in fact, it was only out of a Christian worldview that science was able to develop. And that as uh, challenges to Christianity come, as postmodern develops, science becomes less and less believed. And how Bob will show as well how the scientific method in science itself is completely and utterly congruent uh, with the Christian worldview. And in fact, the Christian worldview is necessary for science to flourish. Well, some of you might say, what about the young earth? Well, that's a good question. Here's the analogy which was very important to us. And as I'm going to try to show you with my couple of minutes that are left, it's based on something about Jesus, that Jesus said. Basically, there's a Grand Canyon, and on one side of the Grand Canyon are those who believe in evolution. On the other side of the Grand Canyon are Christians who believe that there is a God who has designed and created all things and sustains all things. And on the Christian side of the Grand Canyon, there's different camps, a young earth, old earth, theistic evolution, all sorts of other offshoots. And we like to shoot at each other and diss each other and do all that type of stuff. But tonight, we're not looking at one side of the Grand Canyon. We're studying the Grand Canyon. And this comes, I think, because this is what Jesus would have us do. In 1998, through the sixth game of the NBA playoffs, the Chicago Bulls were playing the Utah Jazz. Chicago Bulls were up three to two. They were trying to win their third championship in a row, their six and eight years. They were playing an unbelievably talented Utah team, and they were in front of rabid Utah fans. And it was very important that they win that night so that Utah didn't get the momentum and maybe potentially win the entire series. And at that time, some of you know, maybe the greatest player of all time, Michael Jordan, was on the Chicago Bulls. So here's the question. In the room, as the coach is talking to the players to send them out onto the court to play the Utah Jazz, he probably would have said something like this. The first part is you all have to do your role, you all have to play hard, we all have to be a team, but the key to winning this game is giving the ball to Keith Booth. No, he would have said, give the ball to Michael Jordan. Who's Keith Booth? Keith Booth played in that game. Somebody has to be at the end of the bench. He played six games that season, averaging only two minutes a game, and I think he only managed three baskets in the entire season, and nobody, unless you're the most fanatic Chicago Bulls fan, has ever even heard of him. They said, Give the ball to Michael Jordan. So here's it. I, I, for a Christian, if I'm going to have a conflict with evolution, that if I lose, it proves atheism, what do I want to say? Give the ball to Jesus. Give the ball to Jesus. And what did Jesus teach? There's a bit of a, a, a jump here, but I think everything in the Gospel of John ultimately goes back to what Jesus teaches. And what does Jesus say? In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God. And with is a personal word. Word, he's, uh, John is using language to allow to be translated into many types of things of something different, this mystery of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life is the light of men. And that's what we're going to be looking at here tonight. See, the fact of the matter is that not only does evolutionary theory have to say that matter, energy, pure chance, and cause and effect accounts for life in the intricate fine-tuned universe, it also has to claim that matter, energy, pure chance, and cause and effect accounts not only for those things, but also for morals, human dignity, freedom, and love, and how our minds know. And I don't think it can carry that weight. 
But if, in fact, Jesus is correct, then what it means is that all things that have come to exist are a result of love and life and light from the triune God. And only that can account for what science is discovering and the longings and the yearnings of our hearts. You see, as reason progresses and as science progresses, it is as if it is showing how there must be some type of designer. And if you just take for a moment and imagine that what we see is something as, as if Alice is, you know the, you know the Alice and um, uh, the, the glass slipper, right? Do I have Alice? I have that right? Yeah, the glass slipper. Cinderella, Cinderella not Alice. <laughs> on earth could I have nine kids to get that all wrong? My youngest is 20, that's why. I haven't spent time with my... <laughs> Cinderella's glass slipper. And it's as if physics and biology, as they characterize and figure out what the design looks like, it's as if they're building a glass slipper. And as we look at the longing of our hearts and the yearnings of our hearts and the nature of morality and the dignity of persons and the importance of love, all of that is as building a glass slipper and I can tell you that only one foot fits that that if you progress, only the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit who's created all things and sustains all things, that is the only shape that fits that glass slipper. I'm really glad you're here. Ask your toughest questions. I don't get to be on the panel. Ask the other guys your <laughs> toughest questions. And I hope it leads you to Jesus. Thank you very much.